Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening public lecture organized by the Center of, for Catholic Studies. Before we start, we would like to invite our new director, Dr. Anselm Lam, to give his words of welcome. Well, good evening. Um, well, address ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, sisters and brothers in Christ. Well, it's a quite good number of audience tonight. Um, um, I, I know it's not because of me, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, because of Father Jerry, our guest speaker. Um, it's our great pleasure and honor to have you here tonight for the um, public uh, speech um, lecture. Your presence here is a vivid sign of your support to our center. The Department of Cultural and Religious Studies established our center in 2005. Um, since then, Father Louis Haki Long is a vital figure of our center. Um, by his contribution to the intellectual apostolate of the center, we achieve um, a great success in the studies of the history of the Catholic Church in Hong Kong. Um, but we're sad or sentenced to say he retired a few months ago. After his invaluable service to the center for um, almost over um, 15 years, um, he retired um, from our center, but he still keep a part-time um, position in our center because I, I, we don't want to lose him. We want to keep him as long as we can. Um, to contribute to our intellectual apostolate and uh, research project on um, history in Hong Kong Catholic Church. Along his path, our center started a new stage of development last August. Um, the Chinese province of the Jesuit and I joined the intellectual apostolate of a center. Um, of course, a new start, we have to think about the new direction or the um, new plan for our center. When we were working on the three-year plan, and after long discussion, we came to the consensus that reconciliation is the central theme of our center. I believe that you would agree with me that it is a blessing that we can enjoy an inspiring talk in such leisure environment here during this time in Hong Kong. We have experienced fear and anger sadness and frustration due to the broken relationship in family or society over the past few months. Some people may ask, what can we do? Uh, maybe we ask, what can the Catholic Church contribute um, to settle the movement or to walk along with the Hong Kong people in this situation? I think reconciliation is the way. However, we understand that it is not an easy task, nor reconciliation, uh, some action or activities outside us. It's also concerned our inner selves, the conversion of ourselves. Father Bernard Lonergan, a Jesuit, a very renowned philosopher and theologian, has differentiated different forms of conversion, namely, intellectual, moral, and spiritual, uh, which are very inspiring to our concern of reconciliation. The question is, how can we translate Lonergan's conception of con conversion to facilitate reconciliation today? And we know that is the purpose of getting together here tonight. We want, our center wants to provide a platform for thought exchange, idea exchange, reconciliation, Bernard Lonergan's concept of conversion is the theme of a public lecture tonight. It is our honor to have Father Jared Huilin, a renowned scholar of Lonergan's thought, to be the speaker of the public lecture tonight. Father Huilin is an Irish Jesuit, a theologian of systematic theology. He was ordained priest in 1992 and was awarded a PhD in systematic theology in 1996. For a dissertation, the development of Bernard Lonergan's notion of the dialectic of history, a study of his, his writing, 1938 to 1953. 
And this topic expressed his abiding interest in how the right kind of theological method can show both loyalty to Christian tradition and attentiveness to questions of social justice and the evangelization of culture. In the period of 1996 to 99, Jerry returned to Nairobi teaching theology at Hikima College. In 2000 to 2006, he also took on the responsibility as a parish priest as well. So um, Father Huilin is not um, purely academic, but also pastoral. Um, when we had dinner together, I said it's very balanced, right? Not, not only think something abstract, right? remote from the reality, but also work, you know, very, very on earth with the people. And of course, pastoral work always a challenge to a theologian to reflect more, you know, deeper about Lonergan's idea of historical consciousness. And in 2007, he was assigned to teach theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University, Rome. In 2013, he published a book, Redeeming History, Social Concern in Bernard Lonergan and Robert Doran. He is currently working on a variety of publications about Pope Francis, and his latest book is A Discerning Church, Pope Francis, Lonergan, and a Theological Method for the Future, which will be the topic for tomorrow's lecture. Um, tonight, Father Jared Whelan will give his lecture for an hour, then followed by Father Stephen Tong's response, and then open forum for discussion will come afterward. Ladies and gentlemen and brothers and sisters in Christ, let us give a big applause to Father Jerry. Good evening, everybody. So this is the talk, uh, that, as advertised on the poster, in fact. Reconciliation, Lonergan's idea of conversion, in the broken world of today, how can we transform Lonergan's idea to facilitate reconciliation? Uh, just before I start, may I say that I'm really delighted to be here, and thank you for coming, so many of you. Um, I, as you heard, became a missionary in Africa from the Irish province of the Jesuits. But if I had been maybe 30 years older, I would have loved to be, have become a missionary in Hong Kong. Uh, I see Father Sean here. We don't actually know each other, Father Sean. But <laughs> so when I was a novice, I used to hear with fascination the, uh, the work of the Jesuits in Hong Kong and how instead of doing the, uh, the school's uh, regency, we called it, the study, uh, the, the pra pastoral work between philosophy and theology that every Jesuit has to do, the Hong Kong Jesuits studied Cantonese for three years. And they used to say, and still we didn't know enough. So uh, I was fascinated by that challenge that all of the Jesuits here went through. Um, the, uh, another thing, I heard there are some CLC members here. Uh, the, I worked a lot with uh, Christian life communities in Africa, in Kenya especially. And Hong Kong was always high profile uh, in the CLC movement. There had been a general assembly in Hong Kong, I think, uh, not long before. I was working in Kenya, so uh, that's another connection I have uh, that makes me feel at home here. Um, one final image, I'm, as I say, I'm so excited to be here, <coughs> but I arrived on early Monday morning off, off the plane, came into Kowloon to stay at, at Waiyan College, and I saw broken glass over the... Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm aware of that reality in Hong Kong as well at the moment, and it's, it's well chosen that the theme would be reconciliation uh, that uh, it will guide the Center for Catholic Studies. So, uh, in fact, just to note, uh, the, what am I doing here? I'm giving two talks at the invitation of the Jesuits. Uh, Father Stephen Tong has been especially a great uh, friend and, and uh, inviter to come here. Um, the, um, but the, the, there's a talk tomorrow which is yet more formal than today, shall we say. It's the official inauguration of the Jesuit involvement in the uh, Center for Catholic Studies. So I'm in, um, a, I don't want to say a dilemma, but I have to be careful. I'm giving two talks. I hope some of you will come tomorrow again. So I don't want to repeat myself. 
and there is a sense in which tomorrow is a slightly more major talk, at least in the formal uh, inaugural sense. So let's see the title tomorrow. Uh, I have to be careful not to tread on the feet of myself tomorrow, so to speak. So a discerning church, Pope Francis and theological method. The, um, the talk tomorrow, a theological method of Pope Francis, Bernard Lonergan Foundations for Interdisciplinary Method. And as Dr. Lamb said, it's uh, the um, a content of my book uh, largely tomorrow. But there are uh, overlaps uh, with uh, the theme for today. Uh, by the way, as I, I walked into um, Wayan College, uh, I saw a big poster uh, saying discernment and reconciliation. And I said, wow, they're advertising my talk already. Uh, the, <laughs> but uh, not so much. I'm advertising these commitments, which are the commitments of, uh, indeed, the Jesuits in, the, in, in these years uh, here in Hong Kong, as well as the, uh, the evident commitment of the Center for Catholic Studies now in these uh, coming three years. So um, that's discerning. Discernment tomorrow, reconciliation today. So uh, reconciliation, so the talk I will give in two parts, uh, the reconciliation uh, sort of general warm-up introduction to uh, the general theme as a Christian theme, and then reconciliation in Lonergan, related, as you already heard, to his notion of conversion. So, uh, and then always remembering, waiting for question time, uh, for listening to, to your links that you might make with the relevance for the Chinese University and for Hong Kong of, of these reflections that we are pursuing on reconciliation. Um, so if I may start in an Irish way, Father Sean knows we, we tend to be very narrative in our approach. Some would say not always very rational. Um, we would just say it can be lateral thinking. We can be going in more than direction at, at once uh, as, as Irish people. So I'd like to start with a couple of stories about myself uh, as primarily and uh, my own experiences that touch on themes that I'll be treating more systematically uh, immediately afterwards. Um, I was back uh, at home in Ireland uh, this summer, as I always do, and I met a, a young man in studies. We have some small number of Jesuit vocations still in Ireland, even though the number has, has fallen greatly. Uh, so I'd never met this man. Uh, he's been in the Jesuits for four years already. Uh, the, um, so we, we were chatting, we, we were driving somewhere together and uh, getting to know each other. And we said that, well, uh, you know, we've never known each other. I've been in Africa and then I've been in Rome. Uh, and, and then I'm talking a little bit and he says, oh, hold on. You must be the Jesuit of the lumin luminous statues. So I said, How? What, what could he mean? And I know that in Jesuit novitiates, stories are remembered, usually of mistakes that a, an early novice made, sort of edifying stories that uh, the, the, the novices that in uh, future years. So it seems that the only memory that remains for me, uh, of me in the Jesuit, Irish Jesuit formation structure has to do with luminous statues of Our Lady. So I'll explain what that is. The, um, when I joined the novitiate, I, I uh, felt I was 22 years old, and I felt that really they could ordain me the next day because I was ready to be a Jesuit, full stop. There was uh, no big problem. The, uh, to my surprise, the, and uh, you have, by the way, the handout uh, here, uh, it mentions uh, psychotherapy and social justice. Uh, the, <coughs> the novice master, a, a very fine man who was also a psychologist, uh, the, said, said to me, not surprising, um, hold on, wait, young man, you have a lot to learn first. Of course, the 30-day retreat, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius um, are essential to the formation. You have to go through that process as, as a novice. But we also uh, had a, a psychologist who would give us psychotherapy, not the novice master who was our spiritual director. So it was an intense time of reflection on ourselves at the same time, as a Jesuit novice, you go out and do pastoral work for periods of a number of weeks, uh, meeting the very poor especially, but then you come back and reflect about that again. One issue that started to rise for me is that while I felt very committed to the poor and to social justice, I had not always been aware that I had anger in me, and it was at times free-floating anger 
I would say it was against those who oppress the poor, but these horrible insights that come to you in psychotherapy, quite a lot of the time it was angry, anger with my father. It was family stuff. I didn't come from an especially troubled family, but I came with your ordinary package of, well, unconscious motivation. I wasn't always, in fact, motivated by what I thought I was motivated by. And the psychotherapy was helping me to realize th th this scary insight that I'm not in control of myself sometimes. Something that spirituality helped me treat by bringing these insights to God. Even at, at times memories from childhood, hurt memories, or memories of recent behavior that I could recognize was not for the best and came out of the blue, I thought, but in fact it was coming from these other, well, the defense mechanisms that had built up for me around some of the wounded memories that I had. All of this was no longer jargon for me because I could put names and dates on, on, on tho those sort of issues uh, for myself. Um, but with the help of, of, well, especially the spiritual exercises, I was allowed to let God in there. And there was a great, well, reconciliation for me, liberation, that I could let God's unconditional love into my heart, even in spaces that were wounded and I did not know were wounded, even into the realm of my unconscious. So one of my uh, behaviors had been to be a very vehement social justice activist. But in truth, partly I was seeking attention for others and seeking to show how far I'd come from my pr rather privileged background. So. The novice master had to choose where to send me for these placements, these experiments that we have uh, as novices. And there was a list of fashionable ones and a list of unfashionable ones. And guess where he sent me? To the most unfashionable one for somebody of my mentality possible. It was selling rosary beads and selling luminous statues outside the, the church of Gardner Street. There's a, a traditional church during the Novena of Grace. Uh, which is a prayer for eight days. You might know what a novena is. So this was not my heroic self-image as a so social justice activist. <laughs> but I'll say this, I got the joke. Uh, I, I, I recognized that uh, really I did need to cool down this self-image. What, what did I mean by, by social justice anyway? Because th these were the poor of Dublin coming in Christian devotion to this uh, uh, um, event, the Novena of Grace, the Mass every day, a kind of parish retreat. And indeed, I was selling loads of rosary beads and luminous statues. Uh, <laughs> but the luminous statues weren't going so well. Uh, and now, I had set up the table. I knew all the details of the table that where I was selling. And there was a big sheet over it. Uh, the, so it was dark under the table. So at one stage, there were a couple of, of, well, they seemed old ladies to me. I'm sure they were younger than I am now. Uh, <laughs> But uh, they wouldn't believe me that they were luminous and wouldn't pay the money. So I said, come on, we'll go in under the table and we'll have a look if they're really luminous. So apparently the image that has forever remained in the noviceship of me is, well, my rear end sticking out the back of the table, comparing whether the uh, statue was luminous. And I can tell you it was luminous, so um, it was a success. But just as if to emphasize the same point, um, during that noviceship process, uh, we had a visit from an older Jesuit, a newly ordained priest. We often had this sort of interviews. Uh, we were uh, six novices. He, he would come and talk personally about his life. He was a, in spiritual direction with our novice master. And he started his conversation with us saying, look, I wish I could go back to the noviceship with you. I need it. Uh, and, but he was receiving some of the advice as a, a man of 35 years old that, that I was receiving as a novice. Uh, he told a story, he was working with tenants' rights. So the, uh, there's a whole tenant sector. Poor people live in rented properties in, in, in Dublin. Uh, he was involved with an association that both helped individuals and campaigned for a change of the law to protect tenants. He described a case where there was a little old lady said that she was getting harassed by her landlord. And without studying the case very carefully, he went straight to the press 
and denounced the landlord by name. Shortly afterwards, the lady got kicked out completely, evicted of her, of her, of her tenancy. And she then told him, or somebody else told him, that in fact, that lady had no rights there and the landlord had been relatively kind to her, but had started a process to try to get her removal. But it was accelerated once this, this uh, Jesuit acted the way he acted. He said he was mortified to recognize in spiritual direction that he had done this for the sake of image profile with the newspapers, that he had become an oppressor of the poor in the name of helping the poor because he had not explored his own unconscious, his own contradictions, and that he really repented for this and he, he was able to find a solution for the lady, but he was saying he was working on himself big time because unless, he said, I can be reconciled with myself and with God, I cannot engage in any kind of ministry of social justice. So he maybe didn't use the vocabulary then, but uh, he, he would have said, I cannot be in the ministry of reconciliation in society unless I am reconciled myself with God and with others. And that includes unconscious healing of past hurts. So moving along, I'm still in the narrative uh, ramble, if, if you'll um, uh, forgive me, if you'll allow me. Uh, I went to Africa. I was there for 14 years. Um, my parish work in Nairobi was on the periphery of uh, uh, Nairobi, as, as Pope Francis says, in one of the slums of Nairobi. Uh, I don't know if you remember that Pope Francis traveled to Kenya uh, in 2013. I was long gone by that stage. But he asked to meet the uh, communities, priests and communities from the slum parishes. And they all gathered in this parish, the, the one Jesuit parish in Nairobi where I had been. So it was so moving to see him give a remarkable uh, talk uh, to, to the people uh, of there. And he, um, but my story is a particular incidence of reconciliation, peacemaking, social justice questions. So this was me, I suppose, 20 years later uh, for, uh, as a, than being a novice, when I was living in the big bad world, you might say. Uh, and I hope that the excellent formation I've had as a Jesuit stood to me. So I just tell this story, because, and I, w I won't unpack it completely, but it has many of the dimensions of what I want to touch about. It's the same thing. Be reconciled interiorly, the, d the spiritual religious dimension of reconciliation for action in the world against injustice. Um, our uh, parish had about 100,000 people. Uh, it was a newly expanded slum on the periphery of the city, uh, very few government services, that kind of story, in a muddy valley, uh, the uh, kind of hillside. Uh, the, um, the, but to get, it, was just, it was near a main road, the main arter arterial road that goes from Nairobi west to Uganda, actually, um, the a big dual carriageway. The people from my parish needed to cross a rich housing estate, which had immediate access to the, um, the dual carriageway, which was called Mountain View Estates. So even literally and physically, they were high up with a beautiful view and good air. We were low down in the mud. Um, but crime was very bad in, in uh, Nairobi then, and uh, the community of, of uh, Mountain View decided to build iron gates across the um, uh, place where, uh, uh, around their house. Uh, let me just see if this works. Uh, the, um, oh yes, that's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Uh, the, not working. You can see the iron gate. I don't need to point to it, but uh, just for future, <laughs> that's fine, it works. Thank you, it's okay. Um, the, it's okay. Okay, yeah, I, I have it, yeah. Um, so the, before I got involved in this at all, as parish priest of, of, of Catholic parish priest of the area, I heard of a, a well, a riot, a, a protest march, tear gas uh, from police in the area of uh, the Mountain View estate. Uh, only afterwards did some of my pastoral council people, some respectable um, um, people of a certain age, explained to me that, yes, well, they had been protesting uh, there because it was illegal to uh, put up gates like that it was going to obstruct people from getting the buses. 
uh, but uh, the police uh, just came and tear gassed them. Um, she said, Mrs. Uh, Kamau, I remember, wonderful uh, pastoral council person, uh, said, uh, the, well, the pe police are in the pay of the people of, uh, in the rich housing estate. Uh, they're so poorly paid, the police, that they're very corrupt for anybody who, who can uh, pay for them. Um, the, so I didn't expect to get involved, but shortly afterwards, I was approached by the uh, re representative of the uh, residence committee of Mountain View, saying, um, we ca can you try to do some mediation here? Uh, now, I already had very good relations with uh, the Protestant ministers in the area, especially Anglicans. So I said I would, but it would have to be a joint uh, exercise. So we started some, a dialogue process, Residents Mountain View and uh, our people. Um, it was a, a difficult process. Uh, for example, the, when the wider committee of the residents came for a more formal meeting, there were some very non-dialogical people there, shall we say. I remember one man, I knew his face, he was a big businessman, politician. Um, he came straight down and said, you know, uh, we're just playing a, a courtesy kindness here. We can bring in violence uh, overnight if we want to, 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 to stop you. Uh, so you can imagine that the dialogue didn't go very well then. So, for example, I then had to be careful not to take this as per a personal insult. Uh, so in fact, I said nothing uh, as the Kenyans can be very harmonious, very respectful. Uh, I let it pass, the meeting came to nothing in particular, but I went up to the man privately afterwards so as not to let him lose face, shall we say. But I also went up to the chairwoman uh, saying, you realize the significance of, of what, what he said there, that this was no dialogue, this was a threat. Um, so then there was a pause, that there, there, was some, there were some more protests, we didn't have a lot to do with it. Um, Next thing we happened, we heard a, a young boy had been killed. He was the son of the chairman of the pastoral council of the Anglican parish. He had been walking back home from school in, in his uniform. Uh, there were security guards outside one of the houses who were chasing delinquents. There was a problem of delinquency from the down below place. Uh, the, uh, and they just switched caught him who didn't know what was going on and beat him to death on the street. So now we were expecting serious violence. And the, um, what happened next, it was really out of my hands, but uh, the, at the funeral, at the graveside, uh, there's a strong traditions of how they do funerals in, 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 the, in Kenya in the different ethnic communities. The father gave a, a, a graveside address. He appealed to people that there be no violence that in the name of Jesus Christ who was crucified, let us not be violent and don't become violent in the name of my son or my family. So the residence committee heard this and they were so moved that they immediately convo convoked our group again and we came to an agreement. Uh, it became possible to let all pedestrians through the housing estate to have a, a raised, uh, what do you call it, pole uh, uh, block uh, to check cars, uh, that there would be a, a security commitment, a, a committee down below with us that would cooperate with the residence committee in controlling those gates because it turned out that most of the serious criminals were coming from outside the area. And anyway, the local people down below wanted to stop the criminality as much as the people above. So they found an agreement and instead of those sort of gates going up, there was a barrier that did not stop pedestrians. So you can see all the different sort of themes uh, at work there, but it was important to accompany a process, not let yourself get in the way if you were me, for example, and to recognize God's grace that gave its opportunities for a, a reconciliation to happen. Okay, so this is the sort of serious business that we're dealing with. I've just told a couple of stories that you can see yourselves are laden with insights with, with the, the dimensions of explaining what reconciliation really is. Okay, so I've already mentioned that. What, uh, the, so, part one, reconciliation as a Christian theme. Uh, this is uh, paralleled in your notes, uh, your, your one-page uh, handout here. Uh, so, St. Paul, it starts in the Bible, of course. Uh, spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. 
I've added something to this talk as I reflected about it. Uh, theories of active nonviolence, of reconciliation are the focus in a way that I'll explain. Um, then finally, the Jesuits, the universal apostolic preferences that we've stated uh, last year, that uh, where the theme of reconciliation is more prominent than ever before. Uh, I'll say more about that. So that's part one. Then part two, I move to Lonergan notions of conversion. St. Paul, 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Couldn't, could not be clearer, really. Sure, sure it couldn't. In some ways, my story from the noviceship is already most of what I want to say. That reconciliation begins in our hearts in a relationship with God. And it always involves healing because nobody is, ever gets to adulthood in one piece entirely so to speak. We all carry wounds. There is a reconciliation needed that comes from a supernatural source. Jesus Christ has done something for us. We are able to experience that and it comes as an experience of more love than we thought we deserved with consequences that work itself out in our self-image, in our healing of memories, in our readiness to engage with the rest of the world. I'll be explaining more of this uh, as, as we go on. We remember, of course, some other theological points here. Original sin. We Christians talk about something fallen in human nature and that at a profound level, God needed to reconcile us from the fall. Whatever, however we understand that would be another question perhaps, but reconciliation starts with that fundamental Christian vision. And of course, it has to do with Jesus on the cross, that the, uh, the, the, the carrying of the sin, the bearing of the weight of sin, transforming it into something better, was and evidenced in the resurrection as reconciling us to ourselves and ourselves to each other and ourselves in community to God. Spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius are a way of channeling this. Um, perhaps uh, Father Stephen will, will focus a little bit on this um, uh, after my talk, but the, um, it's really, the, the gift of St. Ignatius is, it's almost like a psychotherapy. It's like a therapy of helping your, you and your interior experience reconcile with God and find your vocation. But it's, it, it's profoundly experiential in a way that was new for spiritual direction in the 1500s when he was um, alive. The, so, uh, you know, you're not supposed to tell people too much about the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius uh, because it's better just to do them. Uh, the, the book of the spiritual exercises is um, a manual for the director. And the point is, all of us can tend to just stay in the abstract, think that because we've studied a sentence, God loves you, that you've experienced the grace that you know that God loves you. They're different things, experience and the idea. The, so Ignatius is trying to work on your experience, uh, but he's trying to, of course, let God work on your experience. And he just sets up the situations for an encounter with God that follows a certain dynamic from healing, reconciliation with self and with God towards becoming an agent of reconciliation, as, as St. Paul says. Briefly again, the first week of the exercises, uh, they talk about four weeks of the exercises, but they, they will often be 10 days, 10 days, five days, five days. But even that is up to the spiritual director to decide because it depends on whether you get the grace or not, quite frankly. Uh, tangent, 
my novice master said that I was the slowest person ever to get the grace of the first week that, that he had uh, uh, directed. Uh, so what is in the first week? You never start confessing your sins at the beginning of a retreat. You always start with an invitation to reflect on God's unconditional love for you. And every year when I come to my uh, eight-day annual retreat, I've somehow lost touch of, with that. The, the, I'm, my, my, uh, my sleeve is unraveled. Uh, the, the, uh, there's a quote from Shakespeare al along those lines. The, I'm a bit ragged. And somehow my sense of ease in the unconditional love of God, it's like the first casualty of the busyness and the knocks of the year I've had. So I always need to get back in touch with that. And I've had the benefit of, of all the formation I've had. So what for people that would be beginning in the prayer life, beginning a retreat, uh, the, what a discovery it is. And it's a joy for me to always say the same thing at the be beginning of every treat, retreat, uh, by the way, uh, is just to invite them to reflect on God's unconditional love. You can do that in different ways. Uh, if you've, but uh, I'm unoriginal in the, my scripture passages even. Uh, Isaiah 43, 1 to 7. Uh, you could try that if you're ever uh, be curious. Hey, hey. Um, Psalm yeah. 139. Um, hey, hey or a reflection on uh, the um, who loved you from your earliest memories. So instead of a scripture session, a, um, a reflection on who That's can right. you remember, who can you remember as loving you from your earliest memories? And you just, for as long as it stays nourishing, remember that person and thank God for that person because they manifested to you the love of God. The, then something happens. It really, I believe in the term supernatural. It has been misused by people, but something happens with retreaters. And they experience something that they had not experienced before, the, um, which is the love of God. Now, once that is in place, the director's, the art of the director is to say, look, that's okay, that has happened. And then you wait, there can be a spontaneous process of the person saying, that's, that is so wonderful, but, and the but is my sinfulness, the, uh, my brokenness. Uh, that it's the, the point is that it's not God's, God doesn't insist on this. We insist on it. It's just, we're, we're so grateful for this experience of unconditional love. We want to clear the decks for the future. We know we're forgiven but we want to state uh, what we have done that has blocked, that, that has not been true to this kind of relationship. And then we experience forgiveness. So it's the moment for the sacrament uh, even there. So again, a liberation. So then Ignatius says, ready to move to the second week. So the, once, the, once the graces have been moving in that way, you move the person straight to the the prayer of Christ the King, an image of Christ the King, Christ the leader, appealing to you to follow. So the point is, in a sense, when you've, once you've done your own business on yourself uh, within the eyes of God, once you're reconciled with God, well, normally, you can have a desire to respond, to, to, to follow God as a disciple. So now the whole, uh, so follow Jesus as a disciple, the whole second week of the exercises proceeds. Basically, you imagine yourself as a disciple following Jesus uh, in, in the public life. Uh, the, uh, can you hear me? Is that uh, it's OK? The, uh, fine. Um, so the, all the rest of the exercises, in one way or another, are involved with uh, being a reconciler of others. And just to to mention it's not only private. Already in the first week of the exercises, there's an exercise where Ignatius invites you to reflect about your sin, but it also speaks about the sin of the world. The sin of the world and my sin, they're, so in, they're interrelated. So you imagine all the, all the wrong that has been done in society, but instead of blaming others, you realize the wrong that is done in you 
and how intimately connected it is to a whole social historic set of evils. And then you even he invites you to, to, to pray a kind of a prayer of wonder and despair, saying, how does God not just damn us all and collapse, bring the end to history? So he invites us to get a sense of evil in the world as well as in ourselves. Now, as I mentioned, this is all subsequent to a confidence in God's unconditional love for us. But all I'm saying is that in reflection on sin, there's something social already stirring as well as individual. And then after the first week, second, third, fourth week, there's a process that is social as well as individual. So we have to find our own vocation. Of course, if for uh, a noviceship, it is do I want to join this religious congregation or not? But the spiritual exercises are open to everybody and they may or may not be at a time of big life decision. Um, the, uh, but uh, it may well be a young person deciding marriage, etc. cetera. Um, but the, um, there's a social dimension that comes to a, a completion at the very end uh, it, there's a contemplation for divine love, uh, a prayer of thanks uh, to uh, God that is Trinitarian, and it's, it's almost like e ecology, like Francis of Assisi, uh, that there, there's this pr prayer of saying, all things flow from you, God the Father, through the earth around me, helping me serve you in continuity with the rest of creation. Thank you for all the gifts and graces you have given me in this retreat, Help me to play my role now in creation, being an agent of reconciliation in the world around me. So that's St. Ignatius and the spiritual exercises. The act of nonviolence movement, um, the, uh, s the struggle for social change without opting for violence. It's something they teach courses on and there have been expert authorities on this matter since the 1800s. The quite early, there's an Irishman that I'm proud to say uh, is, is part of this, Daniel O'Connell, um, an Irish politician who was very concerned for Irish independence from Britain at a time after the 1700s of great, great suffering uh, by the Catholics in Ireland, a great oppression for their faith. Uh, the, um, so. But he, so he knew all of the instincts of anger at injustice. However, he came from a, a well-to-do family and had been sent to Europe for his education and had witnessed the aftermath of the French Revolution and had directly witnessed some of the, the, re the Napoleonic Wars. And he became appalled by the results of violence, even in the name of well, liberty, fraternity, equality. So he resolved that he would never be violent and at the same time he would passionately ded him, dedicate himself to redressing injustice at a political level uh, for the Irish. So he became a very prominent barrister, a member of parliament in London and a, a man who campaigned for, um, started whole processes of mass mobilization of Irish voters using the parliamentary system of, of uh, England as a way of actually, um, first of all, bringing politicians to England, which could make the difference of power between parties, the Irish politicians, uh, but also arg arguing for Catholic emancipation, it was called, a, 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 a law that was passed that relieved a lot of the oppression of, of Irish Catholics in Ireland. Um, the, at the same time, he blocked other legislation. He made himself a pain in the neck to the British Parliament because uh, he was a, a politician there and he was able to talk too long or uh, block the other business of Parliament. So uh, he used lots of methods short of violence through the rule of law to be an activist, to change the law and to, to uh, push for social justice. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Henry David Thoreau um, in English literature, American uh, USA liturgy, uh, 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 literature, an important figure, um, uh, on Walden Pond, uh, a, a person uh, like Daniel O'Connell, very modern, very aware that social structures oppress, 
and then very aware that if you use violence to change evil, you become as evil as the original perpetrator. So uh, he started uh, v very explicitly uh, writing about active nonviolence, uh, uh, civil disobedience campaigns against one thing or another. Uh, there was one stage when he was thrown in jail again. It was almost like overnight issues. He was quite a prominent intellectual, uh, quite an ecology man. He lived uh, close to nature. Uh, the, but uh, one of his friends said to him, honestly, how terrible, what are you doing in there in the prison cell? And he said to his friend, what are you doing out there uh, in a situation as unjust as the one we have? Uh, but never violence. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi read Daniel O'Connell, read uh, Henry David Thoreau, was explicitly conscious of operating within the uh, tradition that already existed of active nonviolence. Um, allow me a digression. Uh, there's an Indian Jesuit who um, teaches spirituality in um, the Gregorian with me, Rolfi Pinto is his name. He did his doctorate on uh, Francis Xavier and a, a Hindu mystic whose name I'm, I forget, I'm afraid, from the 1400s, who was a major influence on Mahatma Gandhi. Um, this mystic was a Brahmin and identified with the Dalits. That was one of his special characteristics. And then he was a poet and a musician. Um, the thesis of, of my friend Rolfi is that all genuine religious experience moves to the poor. You'll find a compassion for the poor coming out of any mystic in whatever religion. But just going back to here, so Mahatma Gandhi, a very reflective man, a barrister like um, Daniel O'Connell, um, was connecting his own um, strands within his own Hindu, Hindu tradition, not least this mystic, uh, with Christian reflection and also this self-conscious modern reflection on active nonviolence. Martin Luther King, we all know about him, I suppose, he read these other individuals. He was self-consciously aware of being a Christian activist within the non active nonviolent movement. The Yellow Revolution in the Philippines. Um, I heard quite a lot about this. I had friends at various different stages uh, from the Philippines. But also when I was in my parish in Nairobi, um, we had visitors come to train us in active nonviolence in the Catholic Church in Nairobi. Um, Jesuits were very involved in the Philippines. I was so proud. Uh, Father Bianco, a big tall man, he's about 80 years old, uh, the, um, coming and talking about their experiences. One reason it was called the Yellow Revolution, they told me, it was actually a woman um, uh, whose name I now forget who, who spoke most about this. She was really involved from the earliest times from a very wealthy background, but uh, got involved uh, with this very uh, happily. And was a kind of choreographer. I think she was part of actually the group, at least, that made a decision about the color yellow. They were also being trained in active nonviolence, including by the Jesuits uh, in the Philippines. Uh, and they had this problem of parallel violence, of groups that would try to infiltrate their mass movements, mass marches against Marcos, President Mar Marcos. And they said, we have a clear philosophy. We have our ushers. Uh, and uh, we're trying to uh, communicate the, 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 the process of active nonviolence. We give training about what to do when you're up against the police and, and, and their tear gas, uh, that you don't provoke, uh, that, that you remain keeping an eye to the moral authority you have as active nonviolent. And if they become the other side unwarrantedly violent against you, well, they are disgraced. And nowadays, the media play, plays a role in, in the active nonviolence uh, reality. Uh, but they were being infiltrated by these uh, violent uh, um, Marxist uh, people often. Um, so they thought and they thought, how can we distinguish? And they started saying, well, they're very macho. These um, violent uh, people are men, uh, by and large, and uh, very macho. So how to embarrass them? Uh, how, how, what, would, what can we do that they would never um, I don't pretend they're part of our group. Okay, we'll all dress in yellow. Men and women will wear yellow shirts. And that it, 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 so apparently in the Philippines, a very non-macho color. So that way they distinguished themselves and gained considerable success in isolating the more violent uh, uh, aspects of, of this uh, active non-violent struggle. 
Okay, Jesuit priorities. Um, the, the term uh, reconciliation, the, uh, well, uh, yeah, I'll get on to it. You, it. It is implied in what I was saying already. What I have, active nonviolence, okay, reconciliation. I'll, I'll, why do we call that by the term reconciliation more than justice? Uh, I, I'll explain that a little bit more fully in a moment. I'm converging on the explanation now. Uh, in, the in 1975, there was a general congregation of the Jesuits, uh, enthusiastic to proceed in the spirit of Vatican II, which is fi finished 10 years before. And um, we summarized the, uh, the mission of the Jesuits, as we understand it, as the promotion of faith and the service of justice, or the service of faith and the promotion of justice. Um, the, and that remains true. And, and characterize my entry into, into the Jesuits, and it, it's, it is a, a direction that I identify with very uh, wholeheartedly. Um, al uh, although, well, I put it there, temptations of Marxism. The experience of the Jesuits was that, in fact, expressed as it was, there was a tendency to have a little, a kind of s sneaky Marxism slip in presuppositions that social justice only comes by some kind of law in history where you have to overcome the oppressor. In any situation, to make it better, you just spot the oppressor and violently overcome him or her. Uh, it's a kind of instinct for people, often of goodwill, who are concerned for, for the poor, who have the basic insight that so structural injustice occurs and the modern insight that you can change structures if you want to. That can fairly easily slip into this mentality of spot the enemy. And, uh, and even if it's just in a, a certain approach to preaching, it's violent. There's a, an implicit violence in there it's, uh, before, uh, sooner or later. So um, you may know that the Jesuits had their trouble, had their problems with uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, who could spot Marxism a mile off. The, so he really did not like th this tendency. One, one can argue, was, was he uh, just in all his actions uh, in this respect? But nevertheless, the Jesuits have freely acknowledged that there is need for a maturing in the process of what we really mean when we say faith and justice. So this last year has been a significant year in the updating of the Jesuit sense of direction, or the Jesuit uh, articulation of our mission. Um, there was a, a wide consultation and then a recent, fairly recently a statement of four ap universal apostolic uh, pr uh, preferences. Spirituality, reconciliation, youth, environment. The, uh, now, reconciliation is the new word for justice. Spirituality is the new word for faith, it's, it's very obviously same thing. So you see faith and justice are re-expressed in the first two, top two uh, universal apostolic preferences, and then youth and environment uh, are uh, as well. So the, I now move on to point out how reconciliation is important for Pope Francis. The, uh, I'll be talking mo much more about this tomorrow. So just briefly, I want to talk about this Marxism point again. When he was being formed uh, as a Jesuit, there was soon to be break out the civil war. So extreme tension between extreme left-wing, extreme right-wing in the country of Argentina, 1960s, 1970s. His uncle was a colonel in the um, army, the Argentinian army was implicated in a coup attempt against, uh, well, in a coup attempt in the government and was um, executed. So that's how close to the bone it was for um, uh, the Bergoglio family. Um, the Argentinians had already developed, his teachers had developed a, a theology of the people that was a version of liberation theology that avoided Marxist um, uh, conflict. Uh, presuppositions. It was uh, inspired by more romantic philosophy. If you have uh, studied philosophy at all, um, that you had rationalism and romanticism 
emerging from places like Germany already in the 1700s. Uh, the rationalism could go towards liberal, neoliberal economics, an extreme form of laissez-faire um, um, kind of right-wing uh, logic. But the same rationalism could go towards Marxism, that this great big plan of history and we're going to just rationally recognize that what is the law of history and we're going to have revolutions to carry out the law. Romanticism was much different. It, it started in Germany, uh, a respect for ordinary people, a, 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 a resentment of this elite in Germ the countries of Germany, the states of Germany at the time, that were kind of sellouts to, well, England and France in, in, in some ways, but uh, uh, admirers of the advanced technology and industrialization that was coming from, from the scientific revolution, but holding their own people in contempt and aping even the cultural mores of the French and the English. So the, the romantic resistance was a resistance by, of poor people who felt even economically the rich were inspiring export industries that were suiting the rich and the foreigners and not the local people. But what, something that really burnt was they felt despised culturally as well. So all of this, even Grimm's fairy tales was part of this movement. Um, Hegel, the philosopher, uh, a lot of German philosophers started talking about the, the value of the local community of tradition, s virtues of solidarity. Uh, they, I'm not defending them entirely. They could be completely anti-modern and uh, irrational because modernization had to happen. Uh, but another point they made was that this is my main point about reconciliation, really. It's that they had a vision of a reconciled society that would be culturally, well, German uh, in their case, uh, and united. So uh, to quote Gottfried Herder in 1770, the king and the peasant are part of the people equally. We want development in this country that serves the good of the whole people. Now, there's all sorts of complexities here. That would become Nazism 100 years later, the Volk. Uh, but these early romantic philosophers uh, can be distinguished from, from the unfortunate fruit that, uh, that developed in the 20th century. Pastoral priorities, I'll be talking more about this. A lot of the vision of Pope Francis, you can summarize in four headings that he, he mentions himself. The time is greater than space. Unity prevails over conflict. I'll be getting back to that, as you can imagine. Realities are more important than ideas. The whole is greater than the parts. Now, I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, so I'm only talking about unity prevails over conflict. Conflict, see, he's a process man, Pope Francis. He doesn't want to approach situations with uh, all the truth of the ideas, uh, and then you just apply it. He jokes about Catholics who want to throw the book at everybody. Uh, the, though you start processes of people building. That's what he means, in fact, by time is more important than space. Time of cultivating true sustainable development. Uh, but as soon as you start any process, you confront conflict. It's just like as soon as you start to reflect on your own life, you recognize your sin. Uh, we're not ideal people. So process is not already perfect just because we say we'll be true to uh, process. So what do you do? You cannot ignore it or conceal it, that there are conf conflicts of what to do next in this community that are so contradictory we can't just live and left live. Face conflict head on to resolve it, to make it a link in the chain of a new process. The, that's the key point. Uh, I don't have time to talk about how uh, this happened in his own life. The, he went through a time of great suffering when uh, he was in conflict with his Jesuit superiors. Uh, he remained for 10 years on the outs with his Jesuit superiors for reasons that are primarily the fault of his Jesuit superiors, in my opinion. Uh, he, he was right and they were wrong in many ways, and that was galling him at a certain stage. He was on sabbatical, he was in Germany. 
he had a profound experience of God's love in a sort of dark and mystical way, saying, look, put it into God's hands. And in many ways, that experience was mediated through walking into a church and discovering this painting, which uh, testified to an, a little known um, devotion to Our Lady that nevertheless has an origin from the church fathers, Our Lady on Tire of Knots. It was associated with a married couple, a rich aristocratic couple that were just on the uh, boundary of divorcing and prayed to Our Lady of Knots and she untied the knot of their broken relationship. Uh, he handed over his pain and his uncertainty about the future to Our Lady on Tire of Knots. Now, she had a solution which is not a very common solution, which was, it's okay, we'll make you Pope 20 years from now. Uh, the, uh, but the, uh, you see the point about reconciliation and conflict and the cross. There's no real reconciliation without a pathway of the cross. Now, I've talked for too long, surprise, surprise. Uh, so you'll have to forgive me and you'll have to come again tomorrow. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> because the, the second half of this talk was causing me problems anyway in preparing it because it anticipates a lot of what I'll be talking about tomorrow. So uh, this is part of my Irish lateral thinking, I'm afraid. This might harm more than help, but uh, the, really this is, this is a talk I could better have given the day after tomorrow because uh, uh, it's a more introductory talk to Lonergan that I'll be giving tomorrow. So I'm just taking themes relevant to reconciliation and conversion uh, in Lonergan in five minutes maybe now uh, that will then um, be, be elaborated upon more uh, tomorrow. Conversion as the basis of philosophy. Uh, so Lonergan took that route. Uh, do you recognize who that is? Newman, yeah, good for you. Uh, so Saint John Henry Newman recently um, canonized. It's not a usual uh, painting uh, of him, very young. But interiority for sure, isn't it? You can see uh, the, so four characteristics of the young Lonergan in his 20s, 30s. What established his basic vision? He was a Canadian Jesuit born in 1904, doing philosophy studies in England as the Canadians tended to do. And already quite a bit of his vision was established that would be carried out in the rest of his life as, as an academic. That in included teaching in the Gregorian where I now am. So four characteristics that, and I'm only going to talk about one of them now. Uh, the, so he disliked neo-scholasticism. He was influenced by British philosophy, which accepted the reality of the scientific revolution, believing Catholic thought had to modernize in response to the scientific revolution. Last, Catholic thought needs to develop an alternative to Marx. I'll say more about that. But meanwhile, John Henry Newman. As Catholic thought is trying to engage with modernity, it cannot just repeat the formulas of the past, stale abstract formulas from a decadent late Middle Ages. But how to go, where to go next? You have these British philosophers that seem to worship natural science as the only source of truth and the methods of natural science the only reliable source of objectivity. So here you have John Henry Newman, an Anglican priest, reflecting about truth and converting to become a Catholic priest, but very aware of the times he was in, very much in dialogue with his, with his own peers, with politicians and philosophers. The basic option of John Henry Newman is to turn to interiority, reflect on your interior process, and recognize that the same person who produces discoveries of natural science is capable of making objective ethical judgments about how to move to the ought from the is, something most British philosophers were not doing successfully. But then there's the question of religion. And he was insisting in his book, The Grammar of Ascent, this person that is now self-reflective can with full confidence make a somewhat mysterious act of faith in confidence that this is reasonable to do, but there's still the aspect of leap of faith, of course. But nevertheless, in, in a modern philosophical way, by appealing to interiority, Newman said, you can embrace the natural sciences with ethical 
human sciences and religion. That was a fundamental option that Lonergan took. So he would write this 800-page book called Insight. It, uh, I'll talk more about that tomorrow, but it's, it's about intellectual conversion, that you have to uh, recognize the structure more than Newman was able to do. Newman, uh, Lonergan was deeply indebted to Newman, but believed he became, he went beyond Newman and became more systematic about what is the interior structure of ourselves that we can affirm in a philosophical act of intellectual conversion. Well, it's basically this. We pass through these four levels of consciousness, experience, insight, judgment, decision. Now, we always do that if we're authentic. All, all, people always did, but they didn't always know they were doing it. So for, again, for those of you that have some philosophy, there's something of a Cartesian turn to the subject here, an invitation to self-appropriation that um, nevertheless is consistent with Catholicism with Christian faith in a way that Descartes is not. We've, I've been talking about the, even with Saint Ignatius of Loyola, the social parallel to what's going on in your interiority. Uh, Lonergan was very clear in his desire to be a help in history, to help the poor in history. So the invitation to personal conversion was just a beginning. So on the basis of his intellectual conversion, he spoke about a heuristic theory of history. This needs more explanation. Tomorrow won't be enough. Uh, but the, um, these, uh, progress is an ideal line, a heuristic category, he called it. But he used the metaphor of vector algebra. It's a, these three vectors are required to analyze the movement of history. Progress, decline, redemption. Progress is what would be the situation if people had been authentic in their decision making. Decline is approximating the reality more carefully, at least in its mixture with, with uh, progress. The product of selfish and stupid decision making. The situation we're left with is a combination of progress and decline always. But just as there is this miracle of grace in individual life, so there is the miracle of communities of redemption in history. He uses a, that vague language so as not to pretend it would only be Christianity or Catholic, for example. But uh, the, those communities of those who know that there is this divine intervention in consciousness that is, in fact, a divine intervention against the problem of evil. And that these communities are capable of reversing decline and promoting progress in history. So that's the result of end result. I've explained 800 pages of Lonergan's philosophy now. <laughs> uh, it, it only pretends to be philosophy. So the, the theme of redemption is uh, very uh, little developed. And part two, in a sense, he's a man of two books. And the, um, the second book is how do we help mediate redemption to history as a religious community? Uh, theology mediates between a culture and the significance and role of a religious tradition within that culture. And based on this self-appropriation that is intellectual conversion, he talks about um, the, uh, well, I'm going to skip this now. Religious conversion is being grasped by ultimate concern. OK, uh, well, because this, his method in theology, it's a very crude diagram to express the different two phases, a phases of retrieving a religious tradition a phase of mediating it to a culture. Now, I didn't put arrows in because, in fact, they go in both directions. The engagement with culture can provoke questions and offer insights that need to be brought back to the way that we retrieve the Bible, the way that we, we retrieve our tradition. So uh, that's basically his, his method, is an expansion explaining wh what that diagram means, you might say. Um, but by the way, he... Um, expands his, his analysis of the human person and what we have to appropriate in conversion is much more developed than um, in insight. So he talks about religious conversion and moral conversion very eloquently. And then intellectual conversion names the structure of that, of, of God's action as well as our natural processes. Religious conversion is being grasped by ultimate concern. It is otherworldly falling in love. 
It is total and permanent self-surrender without conditions, qualifications, reservations. For Christians, it is God's love flooding our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. It's very Ignatian, actually, very experiential. But this is important in the academic instruments Lonergan proposes for retrieving a tradition and mediating to a present. Now, I'm afraid I'm just going to um, finish with this slide. So I'm afraid I'm skipping something I like to talk about, which is uh, Robert Doran, who expands on Lonergan with more attention to psychoanalysis. Uh, I'll leave that for another day. I have another book where I, I explore that point. Um, but staying with Lonergan's method and theology, just pointing it once again, this, this dialectic between interiority and engagement in history. The last of his um, eight functional specialties that he talks about in the method is called communications. He says, communications is where theology bears fruits, fruit. It draws on the virtual resources of a culture to mediate redemption to history. Here's a slightly longer version, and I'll, I'll stop with this. The Christian, Christian message is to be communicated to all the nations. Such communications presuppose that the preachers and teachers enlarge their horizons to appreciate the virtual resu resources of that culture. And that language that they must use, those as virtual resources, they must use creatively so that the Christian message does not become disruptive of the culture, not an alien patch superimposed upon it, but a line of development within that culture. So you see that that's the um, progress, decline, and redemption at work. That you have to, uh, in the act of redemption, you have to recognize what is a progress in the culture. You have to make, on the basis of your X-ray vision, because of your self-knowledge, the difference between authenticity, bias, between responsiveness to God and sin. You can read what's happening in society, name what is progress, what is decline. And uh, preaching becomes a promoting of progress that is already present in a culture, uh, the, or just Christian ministry, redemptive ministry. Uh, equally, it becomes resistance to decline, but that would need to be active nonviolent resistance. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Father Whelan. Now it's time for uh, Father Stephen Tong's uh, response to um, Jerry's talk. Yeah. So what I want to say is, um, Father Whelan's sharing was very rich. Uh, you just say he has no time to finish, actually. So my poll focus is mainly on reconciliation with oneself from a Lonergan's and Indonesian viewpoint. So the triangle is usually used by our safety house uh, presentation about um, the three dimension of our relationship uh, with oneself, with others, and with God. Uh, the whole center is about love. Uh, so love penetrates all these three dimensions. So, but my focus of course mainly about reconciliation with the self. Uh, actually, uh, Jerry already uh, put it in the beginning of his uh, uh, not Vichy experience. Okay. Um, so condition of this reconciliation. Uh, um, so the word he often used few times already about the interiority. Uh, the innation, Saint Ignatius uh, start this journey. Let's go to the inner world of our experience and attentive to it. Uh, this picture, uh, yeah, I, I steal this uh, PPT from my colleague, Sally. Uh, so all this, uh, his, her contribution, uh, the pictures and something. Um, so you can see the, the image of going deeper and deeper uh, into the, our, our own interior world uh, and attentive to it. Uh, um, this at attention includes something we like, the positive, uh, something we don't like. 
Uh, so I, as a good uh, disciple of Long Lagan, uh, I start with experience, uh, like Jerry. Uh. So, so I talk uh, with a uh, uh, spiritual direction experience uh, to illustrate my response, uh, how I understand Long Lagan. Um, so I, I didn't tell you this SD is, is recent or long ago, a man or a woman, you will just guess. No? So I, I was giving a SD session, a uh, few actually, not only one, uh, with uh, retreat. Uh, I use, sometimes use he, sometimes use she. Uh. Um, so as a few days retreat, you start to talk about your own experience in prayer. So, so of course I don't, I can't tell every detail. I just mentioned some the main parts. Uh, so one day he came to, in my room and tell me the prayers, and he was in a happy mood, uh, um, reporting what happened to him. Uh, so he said, uh, "When I entered the chapel, entered the mass, uh, um, I heard a voice. Uh, uh, I have to sit in the middle." Um, and then um, I have to do something. I have to do something. Uh, all this, he's in a joyful mood to tell me, me about uh, the inner voice in him. So what brings my attention is this word, have to. And then the other day, he talked about he went out uh, to walk in Chang Chao, you know, uh, uh, so he went to this uh, near the beach area, different roads to visit the cave or, or the walks. Uh. So he told me when he walked into every section of the road, he, he, he always heard the voice, uh, he always discerning uh, which way to, to walk. Uh, 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 I seem the voice affirmed me to walk this way, not that way. And some hours later, uh, the voice affirmed me, I have to return to save a house, not to explore anymore. So I, I, I hear all this, yeah. Mm. Overwhelming religious language. And then I, when I listen to all this, I, I pay attention to my interiority. I feel discomfort you know, uh, because of this word, have to. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, for a well-trained je 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 Jesuit, we are very sus suspicious to all this. <laughs> Um, later, I told him, uh, uh, only 10 commandments have to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so so my, my f I attend my own feeling, I feel suspicious, I feel discomfort. So, but he feel joyful. You know? <laughs> so different in theory. Uh. So I, I follow this attention to my own interior discomfort, I try to bring out what I want to say. Uh, it seemed to contrast his joyful mood. Uh, so I, I, I cut the long story short, I'm not doing, telling all the story, but just that, what brings up. So, so we engage with further conversation and mutual exploration. Uh, so, for example, why you always use have to? You have to sit in the middle uh, in the church. Uh, um, so slowly, yeah, he can de detect, yeah, that um, actually, yeah, put a long story short, he has his own uh, scruples. Uh, if you're familiar with St. Ignatius' story, you know, uh, scruples uh, to see something wrong, actually, without any wrong but you think you are committing some wrong, uh, so-called scruples. So, so in his life, actually, the story is about, is really afraid to make mistakes. So contrast to what Jerry said, the unconditional love of God that in the beginning of the retreat, they're supposed to experience. Uh, so what I, I bring out this process is just explain what I want to explain late now. Uh, is um, both of us attentive to something happen within. So we create a connected distance. We can talk about it, describe it further. How do you feel about when you say have to? 
Ah. Feel about when you say have to is a connective distance. Ah. Um, stay and contemplating what is that. Mm. Uh, Descripting and naming it. Ah. Of course, slowly this escape his attention is from his fear. A uh, scupo usually is about fear. But this fear has to be owned. It's not just a name, you know. You own your fear in that moment. Not just talk about fear in general, how to deal with fear in general. But at that special moment, special term. So, yeah, this is long again, famous diagram. Uh, uh, so I try to bring out the process. No? Mm. Contemplating one's interiority in a conversational context, uh, in a SD session. A basic description and external revelation because his body language tell me something um, um, all this have to all this about pain and his smiling and something uh, in in incongruent so I contemplating what he describes and also the external revelation in his body language the interiority elicited in the counterpart in me. I feel discomfort. Uh, I can, I can no notice what happens in me. A mutual revelation and conversation, uh, because we build up the relationship of trust. Uh, we talk about it, uh, and I ask him to describe more, uh, to un how you understand this. I, I raise questions to him. Uh, from external to internal to deeper dimension. From external, what he described, he has to sit in the middle of a church. From external to internal, and then from internal to deeper, his own history. Uh, uh, um, from aware movement to the unaware. Uh, now all this is, is experiencing all this. It's not in the idea, it's not in the abstract. What I write this is all slowly in the conversation process, we try to, to discover it. From isolated movements to a regular pattern. Uh, it's quite isolated different things during the day, during the prayer, but to a regular pattern, for example, Afraid to make mistakes. This is a regular pattern. From intellectual lowing to affective insight. Uh, mutually providing evidences to confirm or deny the discoveries of understanding. So my role as spiritual director, of course I'm not sure I understand rightly. I put on my presumption, uh, my initial understanding to let him decide whether I understand right or wrong. I let him decide for me. I tell him something, what I observe, what I understand from my little experience as spiritual director for some years. Is it, is it happened to you something like this? I, I, I ask him, we provide evidence. I tell him, I observe you this. I tell him the evidence that I see let him confirm or deny, oh, no, 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 it's not there. So he has a chance to confirm or deny what I say. <coughs> the affirmed discoveries can be the path towards conversion or reconciliation. So in doing this, he slowly reconcile with himself. Actually, there's certain dynamic, certain force that is making him unfree. He is afraid of making mistakes. So this is what I want to conclude in this about general empirical method. What I just described, I want to highlight to this really important uh, Lonergan's contribution to theology and other aspects. Uh, this, this term is very nice, called general empirical method. The short form is JAM. I think this is the gem of the whole Lonergan's pro uh, uh, project. Uh, Lonergan certainly influenced by the British uh, uh, 
uh, em empirical tradition. Uh, so, because for him, si science really rendered, the s uh, since 17th century, the scientific revolution, uh, since Copernicus, uh, Galileo, and New Newton, uh, even up to now, we are still under the ripples of the effect of the scientific revolution. Even all this technology that we are using is, is the fruit of scientific revolution. So for Lonergan, in his book, he likes to say, uh, compared to this, uh, a reformation in 16th century, even the First World War or Second World War, the only episodes in the history. The event is scientific revolution. Uh, see whether you, uh, you agree uh, or, or not. So for him, the success of science is due to the empirical method. Uh, um, started by uh, Galileo, certainly, uh, to overturn the uh, Aristotle way of science. Uh, uh, science, so, so, and he, Fool Newman, uh, I mean, uh, Jerry just say Fool Newman, I think he, he got a really good insight this our consciousness is empirical as well. What I just say about this SD session, we actually, we are, our inner experience are em empirical. We can describe it. What happened in our heart, in our mind. We can like an observer to, to describe it. Just like a scientist to describe the, the data in the uh, experiment. This is a success of, of science. So for human science, for our inner world, the success also depends on we make it empirical. Both of us can observe, can dialogue, can talk about it. Uh, Jerry mentioned about the social movement, to talk about it. We have the common data or common inner process that is observable. I think this is why I say it's a gem of um, of the whole long against purple project. Um, so from there we have the common ground. Uh, that's why his what for him the operation of consciousness is the common ground for everything. It creates an ongoing and explorative dynamics leading to cumulative results. Uh, a 30-day retreat, a long retreat, is through this process to create a cumulative result. This is what he called the definition of a uh, method. Uh, through the authentic process, a person, a community, create the cumulative effects, just like science. Community up today, we have so much convenience in this kind of talk. We can share so e efficient by this technology. So the interaction between nature and grace, uh, I think here, part of this process is part of nature, just our human capacity, but also it's grace. The discovery for, I think for long again, I don't know whether he say Clearly, the insight itself is grace, a genuine insight. Uh, uh, what Jerry said about the, the redemption process. So my conclusion, uh, the problem of the others in contemporary concerns, and it's always about the problem of the others. Uh, I think if you're familiar with the whole contemporary philosophy movement. Uh, uh, so. This problem of the others, one of the bridge is really through this jam, I think. This jam can be a way to help, uh, provide a solid path to engage in this concern. It's also a way of being the church and doing theology. I say this last sentence to pave the way for Jerry tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I think, what's the church mean? What's, what's the church? I think long against this way of what I mentioned about uh, spiritual conversation in a, in a context, this is in a, in 
like uh, Jesus talked talk about spiritual conversation recently. This is a way of being the church. Uh, how to do theology, I leave Jerry to do it tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Father Jerry and Father Stephen Tong's um, sharing speech. And let us uh, have a glimpse, I think, because the time limit, we have only uh, a glimpse of um, the conception of or the experience of reconciliation and the conception of uh, conversion are going to Bernard Longnagan. Um, I think uh, it's quite impressive and inspiring. Both of you started with an experience first, right? Um, other than, I think, uh, you know, there are two, two methodologies or approach of, of reasoning. One is uh, um, deduction and the other is induction. And induction, maybe tomorrow you will explore more. But uh, and in the Western tradition, um, deductive methods that I think, uh, um, especially from the uh, Descartes, the Cartesian methodology, that means the ideal or the truth um, comes from the, um, something abstract, the idea not from the experience. Experience has nothing to do with the truth. And especially after the scientific revolution, uh, I think Bernard Longnagan and also um, inspired by Newman and tried to um, turn away round, you know, from the deductive approach to the inductive approach. And it's not a, my time, you know, I just <laughs> linked both of their, their sharings. It's time for you and it's the time for um, not only a Q&A, it is an open forum. You may express your ideas, your comment, and also questions are welcome. So um, thank you for this lecture. I think we learn a lot in this evening. But um, I got a few questions about Don again, and I would like to um, see more elaboration from Father Jerry. So the first question is, we usually think about Donegan well, um, in the area of philosophy and in a simplified version, we take him as a kind of um, helping us to know more, helping us to know more about the philosophy of knowledge, put it this way. And it seems that you suggest that Donegan can help us to know more about political philosophy, right? So um, I, I think I would be grateful if, if you can elaborate more on this, uh, this area. Is the mic working well? Um, can, you, can you hear me? Political philo oh, I can hear you, yeah. Oh, thank you. And my second question is about social justice. And you mentioned that uh, your, so your society or your group have replaced the word justice by the word reconciliation. Yeah. But is this also the idea of Lonergan? So uh, this is my second question. And my third question is about, um, about your handout. And you mentioned about there is a Catholic parallel to Karl Marx in Nordegan's ideas. So uh, I think this, this is very interesting because as you know, for the, for the socialists and the Marxists, they develop quite a lot of ideas about social justice, especially about the, about the distribution of resources and the balance of power. So they emphasize on the change of the external conditions, and they believe that the change of the external environment will change the person finally. And they use the wrong way, they use the violence to, to achieve this goal. So for non or for um or for that kind of I mean the um the what you call the Catholic parallel to Karl Marx, can we develop similar kind of ideas about the change about changing the system? change the distribution of resources, change the balance of power, so that you can get something real, something real achieved in your hands. Otherwise, you, you are just mentioning very personal, very individual, or something about counseling. And you are not talking about the change, no, you are talking about the social change. So, so how can this be a um, Catholic parallel to Karl Marx from Lonergan's ideas? And this is my first question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our technician is very capable here. I've given some complicated uh, instructions. Uh, 
the, uh, so thank you for your very insightful question. Um, so uh, you say in the first point, many people have somehow understood that Lonergan talks about epistemology uh, uh, and don't really know where to go next or, or where does he go next. Uh, the, so I, that is the case. There are Lonergan experts even who seem to stay in that kind of field and don't have that kind of pastoral concern that I believe Lonergan himself had or hunger for justice, you could call it. Uh, <coughs> so in part, I'll talk more about these things um, uh, tomorrow. And in part, I, I'll expand one point I had on a slide here. And then I'll also just repeat something I was saying. So uh, the, um, uh, point here is the, uh, in a sense, we start with Newman again. Uh, the interiority is, um, has a relevance for exteriority, shall we say, for, uh, for uh, the working on our own authenticity has a, a relatedness to establishing an authentic society where people can be reconciled with each other because they live in a just order. Uh, the, so just to go back then, second part, elaborating at least these four, um, I'll talk more tomorrow. This is the young, Lonergan, you need to flesh it out with the biography a little bit uh, of him. Um, so the alternative to Karl Marx you saw there. Um, he had been working on this interiority philosophy kind of question, this intuition that the Catholic Church intellectually was not responding to modernity successfully. Uh, but then shortly afterwards, as he's still a young Jesuit, he finished philosophy and some other studies in England he came back to that in-between period Jesuits do uh, a bit before theology. He was teaching high school in Montreal and the Great Depression began. So there was the, the market crash of 1929, the Great Depression. He had gone to that school. He knew the families, you know, his, his friends had now had children in the school, that kind of thing. They were middle class. Uh, Lonergan was himself the son of an engineer, but he witnessed children coming hungry to school whose parents were unemployed and were on soup kitchen lines. So uh, I usually have a photograph of a soup kitchen, actually, instead of Newman uh, on, on that slide. Uh, the, so he felt deeply scandalized by uh, what had happened in economics, that they, they, they sh it should go backwards like that. And then he was very aware of the rise of, Mar of Marxism and, and fascism. Uh, he would soon go back to Rome for his theology studies and witness Mussolini and Nazi, uh, Nazism, et cetera. Uh, so a crisis of civilization. So he, this became his orientation for all of his ph philosophical work. He wanted to help the poor. He wanted to, to change history. However, he uh, was a deeply intellectual person and recognized an intellectual dimension of the problem and an intellectual vocation on his part to help the poor. So he had actually had a professor of Catholic social teaching in the 1920s in Heathrop, England. And that time, there was just one letter of social teaching. It was uh, from the 1890s. Uh, the, but this very capable uh, Jesuit said, look, the, the signs of the times of the 20th century is Karl Marx. 1926, that was accurate uh, the, enough. Uh, the <coughs> Karl Marx is responding to modern problems. Uh, the, he is recognizing the structure of injustice. And he's recognizing, that as we never did before modern times, that we can change social structures. They're not God-given under the king, that kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, of course, he's atheistic and violent. Uh, so something has gone wrong somewhere in Karl Marx. So we need to respect his genius and develop a Catholic parallel answer to Karl Marx. We need to recognize that two things Karl Marx did were very appropriate. Develop a theory of history, develop a theory of economics. Now Lonergan worked on both. He actually worked on economics. Uh, the, uh, I won't go into that detail. But basically, otherwise, the, um, the move to your, your set of questions regarding um, uh, the uh, the political philosophy, the action for social change. My diagram there is my best effort to talk about uh, what Lonergan was trying to do. Maybe just to add that 
he was talking about the intellectual component of the challenge, the progress and decline. Of course, it's concrete. If it, it means policies that leave people hungry, etc. That's very concrete. Uh, the violent repression in, in fascist and uh, communist states. Uh, but he was deeply convinced of the effectiveness of ideas. Unlike Marx, Marx said, if you know, change the infrastructure, you'll, um, the, the superstructure will follow. Uh, Lonergan was convinced that the Christian message is the opposite way around. Change people's world of meaning, and the community will willingly change the social structures as a result. So you, the, the, and the intellectual ministry comes in there. So change the, the arguments for a just society, and, and or try to help people cha have a change of heart. Try, try to have authentic intellectual reflection about society. Uh, the, uh, so that means bi build on what's already there, progress in the intellectual life, name it and pro prolong it, but distinguish what is wrong and false. It, like in the name of freedom, we Catholics would say there's abuses of, uh, of freedom uh, that go forward. Uh, the, you have to confront that and reverse it. So I don't know if that helps, but he was very convinced about the, the role of intellectual life in the reversing of decline and the promoting of progress, even in its most concrete expressions. Thank you. Thank you, Father uh, Willem, Father Tong, and uh, Dr. Lam. Um, the topic tonight uh, really attracts me, and uh, to come is about reconciliation, but also discernment. Yeah, I have heard a lot of uh, very important uh, concept of Long Lugan's uh, history, the context of reconciliation, and also Father Tong. I, I, I would like to know and sh if you can, both Father Tong and Father Willen, about sharing the light of discernment, especially in the broken world of nowadays, um, the reconciliation, the spiritual reconciliation with ourselves, the reconciliation with God, how does it operate? Because Lonergan talks a lot about uh, operation of theology or the method of theology. How can we operate ourselves in this broken world in reality from after reconciling, reconcile ourselves or going through the interior journey, then come to discern what is right and wrong and then come to a decision or share that light? Because I think, I think there are so many um, distortion and so many shadows in a way. So, so I'm very interested to, 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 to hear about the insight of discernment. Thank you very much. Um, the, obviously you anticipate, you, you're asking me a little bit about what I'll expand upon tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> the, that's like the last refuge of a scoundrel. Uh, Maybe I hope you don't come tomorrow because you'll, you'll, you might feel I'm not answering these. Um, but uh, what, I, what I'm going to say might sound strange, almost disloyal. At a certain stage, I prefer not to use the term discernment anymore when we're in academic uh, life. So we're talking about a discerning person. And you, the, the spiritual exercises are for everybody. And for, you make decisions in your ordinary life. So I'm, let, let me talk for a moment about the category of being an academic, a, an intellectual, and trying to talk about government policy and, and, and those sort of matters. Um, the, the instinct of um, discernment, the intuition of discernment, needs to move through another, to another step that is the other side of intellectual conversion. That's what Lonergan would say. Intellectual and moral conversion. So it's not just that you need to be an authentic person. You need to have self-appropriated to, to understand the, um, the structure of your, your authenticity and everybody else's. And that becomes a basic methodological tool intellectually for evaluating the authenticity of, well, situations, let's say political situations, their justice and their injustice. Are they the product of authentic decisions in the past or non-authentic decisions? And as I was mentioning, that goes into the intellect, into the academic field are they the product of good economics or bad economics, a faulty economic theory? Uh, the, uh, 
So um, equally, so that's, if you just looking at some of these diagrams, um, remember the, uh, so that's, that's the self-appropriation diagram, experience, insight, judgment, decision. Something I'll elaborate on tomorrow is also at the intellectual level, we talk about bias. So you self-appropriate, you know that you, you could be like that. And then when you're honest, even philosophically, you realize you're just not like that most of the time. We go off the rails at any of those levels. Uh, even the beginning, there are none so blind as those who will not see. Uh, even at the level of attentiveness, we can be prejudiced. There are certain things we don't want to see. We know where it'll end us up. So we, we almost physically don't see them or hear them. Um, insight, you can very often skip insight and go, go to a judgment, form a rash judgment. Or, uh, or you have an insight and you don't really check it. So it's actually false. Y you had the aha experience, but it's wrong. You've misinterpreted something. You are capable with more method, method, with more methodical application of the stages to reevaluate that insight and reject it and gain another better insight into the situation, which will probably be close enough to your slightly wrong insight and move to judgment and then decisions. So this can become the basis of all academic methods in the human sciences especially. Well, it already is in the natural sciences. Uh, the, so, but briefly, uh, just to uh, look for another diagram, it's a few steps down, this one. Um, at the level of theology, we talked about the supernatural, well, at the level of spirituality, we talked about the supernatural event of grace. Well, uh, Father Stephen was, was saying that in, in more uh, detail this experience of religious conversion that can come our way if we're open to it. Now, that is, that's new data in our consciousness. That, uh, so it's not all a question of what, what I'm naturally capable of if I'm authentic. First of all, we're not authentic most of the time. And then we get this experience from without of religious conversion that can get us back on our feet again. So that's why I draw a diagram from above, and Lonergan talks about development from below and development from above. So at the level of human consciousness, we talk about something healing that arrow of, of uh, authenticity. And then instead of the levels of consciousness, he uses these big word, transcendental precepts. So it becomes a should, a norm. Be attentive, be intelligent, be rational, be responsible. This is, I'm talking now, academic uh, uh, method. Every social science and, and theology should be based on these transcendental precepts. Uh, you'd be amazed at how often they're not. The social sciences really go off the rails with their philosophical presuppositions pretty quickly and pretty often. Uh, the, so, um, then, so that's it. If we're doing that, we become an instrument of redemption. So I won't even chase, change the slide. You know my progress, decline, redemption. The, uh, so that's the intellectual extension. So I really prefer that we stop, we talk less of discernment at a certain stage in academic life, and we talk about the transcendental precepts. Be attentive, be intelligent, be rational, be responsible. That can be a fundamental method for intellectual engagement with the problems that we, we encounter. I give another version. Uh, I, I hope I understand your question, Christine. Uh, um, because when we enter discernment, uh, there's a lot of uh, presupposition when we use the word authenticity. Um, uh, just like I take an example, maybe easier. Uh, recently, uh, in my homily, I talk about these examples because in Hong Kong, you know, uh, you have different WhatsApp groups, you know, uh, people exchanging data recently in uh, uh, daily events uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, so at least in a, in a WhatsApp group, you have at least two kinds of uh, political stance. You know? uh, so people passing this kind of message can create anger, create disagreement, uh, create all kinds of emotions. Uh, so some people decide to leave the group. So, 
what is the sermon supposed here? It's not so simple because it's related to our why we say we start from in interior movement. Uh, or uh, I just pick up the word he used, religious conversion. Because the person, when he decides to leave the group, he has not experienced religious conversion. So what he tried to do discernment is, 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 is fake. Because if I understand correctly, he take his political stand is more than his relationship with the group. He, they are friends, no? They, they create a friendship in, inside the group. But this love is not greater than his own political stand. Because his experience of love is not enough. So his discernment is uh, inadequate even though he calls all the information that he knows. Because something missing. That's what it's called religious conversion. What, what is more fundamental? Your relationship with this group or your own political stand? Of course, you can ar argue a lot here. I'm not just making it simple here. Uh, but I just make try to sharpen what you want to say. Uh, why? Uh, what Lonergan's emphasize or Ignatius in emphasize so important. What is happening? Just like I make my example, what is happening when you want to sit, have to sit in the middle of a church? What is what is happening to you? This is this is the 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 the, the battlefield we want to uh, to emphasize. Thank you. Um, I think um, you know making. Judgment or making decision is only like uh, uh, Long again said is the only the almost the final steps of uh, before act action. Um, but how can you know you make a good suggestion or uh, make a good judgment? You have to know yourself. You know wh where are you standing? And sometimes um, emotion is only the a response or a concept uh, response to the to the environment. And how how you perceive the reality shapes your emotion. So that's why we have to know um, from the experience, from the emotion, to know yourself, and to make yourself um, as clear as a crystal. And then you you can make a better you may decision or discernment. That's why I think it's also a, que uh, a response to um, um, your question, Lam. Uh, because epistemolo epistemology is closely related to um, social ethics. Because if you don't know yourself, you're, you think you're making a just world um, out of anger. And I don't think your vision of just world is really a just world. And that's why you have to know yourself. And so go back to the interiority of your, your conscience is, is very important. Any more questions? or comments. Um, English or Cantonese is fine. Uh, Mandarin is also OK. <laughs> OK, maybe you, you're waiting for the second talk tomorrow, right? Um, any, any more comments or, or response? If you have a minute, uh, just to expand uh, on um, we just heard about the know yourself, be careful not to act only out of anger. Um, that the, just to comment, this, this becomes very liberating for people. Uh, the, as an educator, I have witnessed people who just uh, have discovered themselves in a way that they never ha could before. Uh, and there are, e this is, can be especially group, uh, true of different groups in society. There are some people who, as a group, are not really normally given permission to think for themselves. Um, the, and women can be included in that in, in many cultures. But uh, women can find this very liberating because uh, they can have their own insights, their own judgments, and their own decisions. And they can be different from prevailing insights. So there is this permission to be subversive 
in, in naming things that are wrong. Uh, so there's a compatibility with this and, uh, and um, all sorts of feminist analysis, racial issues, uh, uh, how Africans can feel that I've worked with that um, very confused between village culture and city life. They can live schizophrenic lives uh, often uh, about the, the home culture and the culture of their educated world. And this involves an invitation to integrate the two, that it is, it is the same authentic person that might be in the village uneducated and uh, the, the grandson, granddaughter that is uh, much more educated living in the city. Uh, it, it becomes a tool for, um, well, just an integration that is very liberating, even at a kind of social level for people. Thank you. Okay, um, before we finish this, uh, uh, this public lecture, we have to give great thanks to Father Huilin and Father Stephen Tong. <laughs> and both of them have given a very inspiring talk and sharing um, and help us to know more about the reconciliation and discernment. Of course, it's because of time limit, we, we just um, have a glimpse of these two concepts. Um, tomorrow, we'll have another public lecture um, the title is A Discerning Church. It's talking about the, um, the methodology of Pro Francis and Lonergan. I hope I'll see you again tomorrow evening. Good night.